to the Wednesday night Bible study. Amen. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And uh, we're looking at these mysteries. The mysteries in the Bible. The Bible is written as a coded message, I believe, in my opinion. And for you to understand a large part of the Bible, you have to understand that it's its own language. And so you have to understand that when the Bible sets the meaning for a word, that'll help you understand it greatly. Uh, if you will interpret the Bible by the Bible. For example, when you uh, when you read a scripture like you you were dead in your trespasses and sin, what does that mean? Who is that verse to? That verse is to people that are walking around, breathing, uh, apparently seem to be alive, but but there was a part of them that was dead. And when you put the rest of the Bible together, that's the part God's talking about 99% of the time. It's your spirit. So your spirit, their spirit was dead. And so when you read the Bible, sometimes it gets, people let it confuse them and stuff. And it doesn't need to be confusing. But it wasn't written to confuse you. It was written for your learning. But it's, it's not, not just, just given, given to, to anyone. anyone. How many of you know the verse about throwing pearls before swine? Well, God puts that in there, and he adheres to his own scriptures. Um, most of the Bible is just not on the surface for you to just grab and take off with. It's something that you have to uh, earnestly dig and look for. And so that's what we try to do here. And so these mysteries, while they're hidden, now that makes sense, isn't it? It's a mystery. So look at this, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So if you're a minister in Christ, you are a steward of the mysteries of God. And you guys have all been here for this series. I believe if the ministers of God had been true and good and faithful stewards to the mysteries of God, the United States wouldn't be in the shape it's in. I believe the blame lies at the pulpits, not with the politicians, not with the people of America. It starts at the pulpits. Now, I believe it started in, in uh, Christian education. And the Christian education in the seminaries and universities trained these uh, men that, and now women that went into the pulpit and they trained them what to preach and uh, how to preach and they indoctrinated the whole nation. And so I put a lot of the blame at the pulpits. It says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And I think you'll see when we get done with these seven mysteries of God, if the pulpits had been true to teach these mysteries, Maybe we wouldn't be in the shape we're in. At least we would. Uh, at least we'd still have some sense about us, right? You stop and think about where we're at as a nation. In just the last ten years, uh, we have fallen to a place that I would have never even fathomed in ten years. Um, today, it was let out that um, Joe Biden, Vice President Joe Biden's son has been accused by two uh, Congress committees of sex trafficking in Ukraine. Yet you didn't hear anything about it on Fox News, did you? Or CNN? Now, if that had been one of Donald Trump's sons, you remember Joe Biden's son, the one that they found the... Uh, crack pipe in the rent a car along with some drugs and a pistol and a bag of dimes. Uh, most people have never even heard of it. I've, I've asked Democrats about it and they're like, you, you make stuff up. It's, it's an indoctrination, people. Uh, you only hear what they want you to hear. And for you to hear the truth, you've got to do some digging. Can you imagine, you know, 
Hunter Biden, right? The one that was in collusion with Ukraine. Y'all all know Hunter Biden, don't you? The one that had the illegal, uh, illegitimate child with the uh, stripper. Y'all all know Joe Biden. Remember, Joe Biden's son, Hunter, that the stripper mama wanted uh, secret service protection for the baby. Maybe you haven't heard all that, I don't know. How about the uh, Abrahamic Accords? Isn't that a great thing? Isn't that a great thing? Peace in the Middle East. Well, I tell you, it's a deceptive thing because all the nations that signed the peace treaty weren't at war with Israel. Israel wasn't bombing the United Arab Emirates. There's no nation that signed the Abrahamic Peace Accords that Israel was fighting with. They didn't sign it with Syria. Israel's bombed Syria the last time I counted over 600 times. Syria's never responded or retaliated once yet. Syria didn't sign with them. Syria, Israel didn't sign with Iran. Now that's something to clap your feet about, or Iraq, or Libya, you know. But they signed, it wasn't about a war treaty, it was about a treaty between religions. And we showed you that last time. So we're not going to go back and rehearse that, but sometimes what you hear over and over and over is programming ain't exactly what's going on. Do you know one of the stipulations, now this will blow your mind, maybe, I don't know, one of the stipulations of the Abrahamic Accord was that the United Arab Emirates would be able to buy uh, a whole bunch of F-35 fighter planes from the United States. Now, does that make any sense? In a peace accord, part of it was that the United Arab Emirates are going to be able to buy the greatest possibly fighting bomber to bomb their enemies that exist. The F-35, made in America. What's great for America, America gets to make them. Oh, and also, don't forget this, there was uh, several, several billion dollars worth of uh, uh, Black Hawk, Cobra, whatever helicopters given to Israel. In a peace agreement? Anyway, so. It would be like if you had two kids on the playground fighting and you made them kiss and make up, but the one says, I'm not kissing unless you give me a uh, pocket knife so I can stab him. And the other one said, I'm not kissing unless you give me a gun. So, okay. Okay, so anyway, here we go. That's not the Bible study. I just had to get that off my chest. So we looked at this first mystery. This first mystery is the mystery of God in the flesh. And there ain't anybody ever lived that can explain it. And you may not have it totally explained to you uh, for the eternity, in the eternity that we live. Uh, God's always going to be uh, a mystery to us. We're never going to understand Him fully. You're never going to get bored in eternity living with God. He's always going to be fresh. He's always going to be new. He's always going to be creating. He's always going to be uh, doing things. There's never going to be a time when you get bored and wish you weren't up there. But we can try to figure it out, and we have, and we've given you. I was thinking about it last uh, Sunday night when I got home, and I always try to, Sunday night before I go to sleep, I always try to give myself a, report card for the week. And uh, I, I believe last week, I believe for the last few weeks, but I believe last week there was more scriptural truth taught out of this little church than possibly most churches teach in a year. Uh, maybe ever. Why is that? Because we focus on the Word of God. It's not because of us at any, at any means. But whenever you commit yourself to teach God's Word, then God will uh, commit himself to uh, lead, guide, and direct you. And uh, so I was driving home Sunday night and I was doing my report card and I was just thinking, I wasn't even thinking about this thing. I promise you, and I got to buy the Wool Rock. I don't know what it is, Tim, but around Wool Rock is the, is the place and God just dropped a bomb on me. 
And I can't wait till Sunday at 5 o'clock. <laughs> this is another one of these bombs. I, I've studied this thing, this topic, for years. And I've asked the question in my mind over and over and over and over. And the answer was always right there, and I never saw it. But I wasn't even thinking about it. I about had a wreck. So we're going to look at this first mystery. It's the mystery of godliness, the Bible calls it. 1 Timothy 3.16. It's God in the flesh. God, the Creator God. What? Whatever you do, don't think that Jesus is a lesser God or another God. He was God manifested in the flesh. The Bible says He was the Godhead bodily. So there's... It, it gets confusing. I understand that when he's talking to his father and he talks about his father and he's on earth in a human form. All that is is he's playing it out so that you understand that there's a trinity at work here. And all that stuff is his way of getting it over to you. He has to play it out. Why did He come and die? He had to come and die because your blood is corrupt. So He had to provide blood that was pure enough to cover everyone's corrupt blood. You've got to... It's one of the greatest studies you'll ever overtake. But the blood of Jesus Christ that was contained in five courts in a human being paid for all the blood that would damn every person to hell. What's going to damn you to hell? Your blood. Why? Because your blood that gives your body life came from a corrupt source. You say, well, you, you think there's something wrong with my blood? Yeah, you're going to die because of your blood. Unless you get hit by a truck or or, you know, some plane crash or some accident, most people die because of something to do with their blood. But spiritually, you're dead because your blood came from a corrupt source. If you haven't figured this out, from Genesis to Armageddon, it's a battle over the blood. And so what the devil's tried to do and tried to do and tried to do is to make a blood source in a human being that is not corrupt that would live forever and get by and make a liar out of God and surpass God. That's what happened at the flood. That's what's happening today. They're about to get there. Is God going to allow them to get there? No. But they're getting real close. They're about to put something in your blood that will make you live like you never lived before. So this blood contained in this baby, born of a woman, there's something precious about it. It comes from God. The Bible says, God's blood. So God had blood. But can we figure it out? Not totally, no. Can you figure it out that the God that created the universe needs his diaper change? No, you can't. That's why God says he takes the foolish things to confound the wise. I was just talking to this brother back there a while ago before, about the Bible. Why did they change that in, in the early part of Genesis where God told uh, Adam to replenish the earth? They just said to fill because they can't believe, they can't wrap their brains around replenish. Why to tell Adam to replenish? Because they'd been plenished before. That's because they don't study it. anyway. So let's look at this first one here. First Timothy three sixteen. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. There ain't no question about it. There ain't no controversy about it. Nobody's ever figured it out. Nobody ever will. But it is me trying to. But this is a great mystery. God was manifest in the flesh. Now, I showed you this the first time we looked at it. Almost all your new Bible translations, they don't say God was manifest in the flesh. They just give you the record that Jesus was manifest in the flesh. Well, whoopity, they changed God to He. Now, let me tell you something. 
In the Greek, those two words are not the same. In every Greek text that they've ever found, you, you couldn't mistake the Greek word for God for just the pronoun he any easier in Greek than you can in English. But they can't wrap their brain around it, so they change the word of God to fit what they believe. But the word of God says God was manifest in the flesh. Now the Jehovah's Witness teaches he, he, he's, a, he's a lesser God. He's God's way of salvation. That the death of Jesus was God's plan, but the Jehovah's Witness teaches only one Jehovah. Now, there's a lot of people that poo-poo the Jehovah's Witness, but hey, you go to about any denomination you want to all over the world, and when you get them down, and you twist their arm, and you put their uh, nose down in the tongue and groove of the floor, they believe the same thing. Well, we don't. Not here at Matoga Baptist Church. We believe God was manifest in the flesh. Can we explain it? Not totally, but we can get pretty close. So God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preaching to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. That's the first mystery. And if preachers had made sure that they preached that and taught that, then people wouldn't have this ideal that Jesus isn't God. Second mystery, the mystery of Christ in you. Now this is a real mystery. I mean, how can Christ be in you and him and her and her and her and Charlie and Ray? How? I thought there was just one Christ. Well, when we first taught this primarily, we taught you uh, that, that there's a part of Adam in all of us. There's a part of me in my children and my grandchildren. The Bible is very clear that all mankind uh, was in the loins. All the Jews was in the loins of Abraham. So how can Christ be in you? By His seed. And His seed is the Word of God. And His seed is what's required for you to be born spiritually. So it just all starts fitting together. Look at this verse in Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to the saints. This mystery was that God would indwell human beings. That had never happened in the Old Testament. Moses talked to God face to face, but God wasn't in him. David was a man after God's own heart, but God wasn't in him. Now the Holy Spirit would come on him. Like for example, the Holy Spirit came on Saul, the king, and left and never came back. He would not come back. Now in the story of Samson, the Holy Spirit would come on Samson, and then when Samson would start going, uh, messing around with them hoochie mamas, the Holy Spirit would leave. And then the Holy Spirit would come back on him. And then the Holy Spirit would leave. And he would come back on him. And he would leave. And he would come back on him. Until Samson got used to that. And Samson got all to sleep thinking that he could live however he wanted to and the Holy Spirit needed him to be the judge of Israel so bad that the Holy Spirit would come on him no matter what. And that last time, you can read it, it's some of the saddest scriptures you've ever read. The Bible says Samson got up and he shook himself like he had done in the past and he did not know that the Holy Spirit had. And so they poked his eyes out, drug him in there and put him on a grinding wheel. You know the story. He started grinding and he couldn't see anything. All he had to do was spend time with God. And the Bible says he started repenting. And he started praying. 
And they took him out of there and they chained him between two big posts of the Colosseum and he prayed and he asked the Holy Spirit if he'd come on him just one more time so he could kill more Philistines in his death than he could ever did in his life. And the Holy Spirit fell on Samson for him to commit suicide. And so these people that go around telling their loved ones if they have a loved one that committed suicide, that their loved one's in hell, and there ain't no redemption for someone that commits suicide, they're a bunch of devils. They say, well, you can't go to heaven if you commit suicide, because suicide's a murder, and the Bible says there'll be no murderers in heaven. That's true. It says there'll be no drunkards in heaven either. It says there'll be no fornicators in heaven. And it goes on through this list of, of people that won't be in heaven and it says, and so were some of you. In other words, when you're born of God, your past is your past. Well, what if you're born of God but you still get drunk? Does that send you to hell? Heaven, no. Listen, suicide is not the unpardonable sin. Most of the time, the people aren't in their right mind. The unpardonable sin is, were they born of God? Listen, I don't know about you, but uh, I can think of a lot of reasons in this earth where a person might think about taking their own life. He said, I can't believe he said that. Well, tomorrow morning, get your little pie self up, dress up real nice, and drive down there to Tulsa to the burn ward. Go in there when, they, when, they, when you've got a person with third degree burns over 90% of their body and it's time to scrape them. And you tell me. So this ideal that just because a person commits suicide, they go to hell is devilish. The Holy Spirit fell on Samson to commit suicide. Try to get around that one. So this ideal of Christ in you, listen, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now it's made manifest to his saints. Well, it was a, it's a mystery before. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of, his, of, of this mystery among the Gentiles. See, the mystery is, you mean we're going to share heaven? These bunch of Jews, you know. We're going to share heaven, or better than that, we're going to share God with these Gentile dogs? That was a mystery. They never thought that Gentile dogs would... It was warping their mind to think that the Holy Spirit now is indwelling inside of them and then that He would go into a filthy, unclean Gentile dog is a mystery. Something they had to get over. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which is, what's the mystery? Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. So the Holy Spirit's working in him mightily. He says, so the third mystery is the mystery of the church or the body of Christ. Now when we say the church, we're talking about born again people called out assembly from every denomination, from every walk of life. Um, we're not talking about the Southern Baptists. God help. They're falling faster than anyone else. We're not talking about a, a denomination, a Nazarene or something. They're, we're talking about born-again people, and there, there can be born-again people in every denomination. Should they stay in some of those denominations? No, they should not. The Bible says, come out of her. If not for themselves, for their children, they'll be held accountable for that. But we're talking about born-again people building up the church or the body of Christ. We're not talking about a building or an organization. Okay, so this is a real mystery. Look at Ephesians 5, verse 25. This whole section of Scripture is about the church 
The church is called the body of Christ. It's called the bride of Christ. And in this section of Scripture, Paul is using the analogy of the relationship between a husband and a wife. But what he's talking about is a spiritual relationship between born-again people and God Himself through the Holy Spirit in this age. Watch. Husbands, love your wives, even if Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. So Christ loves the church. And husbands, you're to love your wife. Wives, you're never told to love your husbands. Ever. In the Bible. Because most men, I'm not like most men. I'd like to be loved. But most men, they don't care about love as much as they do respect. And that's what, that's what God says. Now husbands, you're supposed to love your wife and give yourself for your bride. We used to go to church with this guy and he would come in from work and he would sit down and his wife always had his meal ready, hot, prepared and he had a little TV tray. And he'd sit down in front of the boob tube and he'd watch TV until he went to bed. That's, that's what he did. So he'd take his clothes off, get in his underwear, she'd sit down a little TV tray, set his plate down and when he got his iced tea drink, he would just shake the glass at her. And she'd jump up, run, go fill it. I mean, you know, those kind of guys. That's hard to respect, isn't it, women? Now, now, is that is that giving yourself for your wife? I'm sure he would say, "I worked all day hard. I don't want to blow hard, whatever." That's not loving your wife. That's not giving yourself for your wife. That's a slave. So. <clears throat> That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. How does the born again person be cleansed? By the word of God. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men, here he goes back to the analogy, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever hath hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. Now I want to ask you something. If you're, if you're a member of his body, his flesh or his bones, how can you lose your salvation? What if you're his uh, femur bone? Are you going to rupture the leg of Christ when you get yanked out of the... Come on. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. For this cause. For what cause? For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Just like you're one with Christ. In a marriage bed, there's a physical representative of a spiritual truth. You're to be one with Christ. How do you explain it? I'm standing here, my wife's over there. Dr. Schweibold is here. Dr. T.C. God knows where. But the Bible says they're one. Lois here, Stacy's here, their wives are someplace else. But the Bible says they're one flesh. Chet and Lori sitting back there beside each other, but they're still separate people. I mean, she's sitting real close because she's cold. How do you explain it? God's using this analogy. So, the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. Paul's telling you, I know it's a mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you, in particular, so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So, what should we do? Love Jesus Christ or reference Him? 
They, they usually ask me when I do a funeral, what do you like to be called, Reverend or Pastor? I said, don't you call me Reverend. There ain't anything Reverend about me. There's only one Reverend thing I can find in the book, and it ain't me. Reverend. Listen to that. Look at that. Look at that. Silly that is. You call another human being with a black heart, black as coal. I know what's in your heart. I know what's in my heart. Why I don't trust myself? Why every morning I keep a close eye on my hand when I shave? Because I'm liable to cut my own throat. Call another human reverend. Get out of here. Look at this. First John 4 4. Watch this mystery unfold for you. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, do you believe that? Yes. Well, is he in you? Well, hang on a second. Look at Romans chapter 7, 18. Romans chapter 7, 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, friend. <laughs> what? Dwelleth no good thing. Well, I thought you just read where greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Paul says that I know that in me dwelleth no good thing. But he gave you the answer in parentheses. Some of you scholars, what are parentheses for? They're to isolate a thought. You're going to put wrap it. You're going to put fence around it. You're going to keep it. Don't forget this. Don't think that Paul's going against what John said. They're both inspired by the Holy Spirit. So how do you figure this mystery out? He that's in you is in your spirit. He ain't in your flesh. He don't possess your flesh. Really, I mean, really. I mean, I don't want to be mean, but do you really think he's in your flesh? No, of course not. Your flesh has a D-Day. And somebody in this room is next. And it, might, I mean, it may not be the oldest or the sickest, but your flesh is it's fleeting, the Bible says. It's like a vapor. It's here, and then it's gone. How many of you seen that doctor that put that video out? He, he had one of them vape things, you know, them, them chemical cigarettes, and he breathed it in, and he put his mask on, blew it out, and all the smoke just gave it. Anyway, that was free. So figure this mystery out. Greater is he that's in you, in the real you, in the you that matters. He's in your spirit. And Paul says in another place, I don't even know what that means. I don't know what we're going to even look like, but I know this. See, you don't have to figure out every piece of the puzzle to know the things that you know for sure. Paul says, I know this. When we see him, we'll be just like him. Watch this. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. See, he has a will to do what's good. He goes on and on and on. I didn't want to labor you with it. But to perform what he knows to do good, this is possibly, arguably, the greatest Christian that ever walked. He can't do it. Now he does it sometimes, but he can't do it to the level of what his spirit wants to do. So the next time you stumble and you have a bad day or you do something wrong, just you know you're in there with Paul. But but be be truthful about it and understand the battle you have, or you won't even be fighting the battle. And what the devil will do will come along and he'll just say to you, "Oh, you're not saved." I got a call a while ago to do a funeral uh, this coming up Wednesday for a lady that they called me the other day and they asked me, would you come and talk to her? We're not sure if she's ready to go to heaven. And, and I said, I'll be right there. And I went over there and I talked with her and we prayed. And 
And I get in my car and I think, who in their wildest dreams would ever think that Sherman Jacobs would be used of God to go pray with a lady and explain to her how she could be born of God? It blows my mind. So, today they asked me, gave me the honor to do her service. So now i got something good to say. Look at this. He wants to do good. He said, for to will is present with me. It's in you. It's in your spirit. You know what I'm talking about. You can feel it. If you can't, you can before you leave here. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. So you get these, these baby Christians in pulpits say, see there, you gotta, you got to do good. But what he's saying is he can't do good. He tries to do good. And even when he tries to do good, most of the time, it's for his own gain. You know, when we was teaching the series on the, on the crowns, I think God wanted me to ask you this, but I didn't have the goods. But I, my sugar's high tonight, so. I don't want you to stand up and testify, and please don't. Please. If you want to come up when this is over and talk to me, that's great. But don't come up here trying to tell me how good you are. I want you to think, I want you to think, not while I'm teaching, after you're going home. Try to think of one thing, one thing that you have ever done for Jesus Christ that didn't have either an ulterior motive or that you didn't gain something for it. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been racking my brain for a long time. I, I don't think I've came up with one yet. One thing, not 10, not 20, one thing that I've ever done that I didn't benefit from it or that I didn't know I would gain something from it, one thing I can't come up with. Look at my next verses down a little further from me. Look at 20. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it. Now, this guy has the equivalent of several PhDs. He's not tongue-tied. He's not mentally challenged. He's not stuttering. You've got to slow down and read it. Look what he says. Now, if I do that, I would not. So he says... If, if I do something that I would not or don't want to, so you know what he's got? He's got two eyes. Two eyes. He's talking about I himself in the flesh and I himself in the spirit. And watch how he does it. Now if I... The flesh, Paul, do that I, Paul the Spirit, will not. Is it no more I in the Spirit that do it? But sin that dwelleth in me, the I, the flesh. Are you getting it? 21? Is it 21? Yeah, 21. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. His inward man delights in pleasing God, doing the law. He's going to explain it to you. But I see another law in my members, in my flesh. It's just a, it's just a way that they spoke, you know, in your body, in your members. Warring against the law in my mind. That is the cognitive part of your spirit. Your mind. 
It ain't your brain. It's not your brain. It's the spiritual part of your intelligent spirit. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So he's captive because he's in this body when his members commit sin. The Apostle Paul didn't get to a sinless nirvana like some of the brethren in the pulpit want you to believe. Oh, wretched man that I am. Oh, wretched flesh man that I am. Who shall deliver me, the real me? Oh, who, who's going to deliver me, the real me, the spirit me, from the body, the flesh of this death, sin? And who he answers his own question. Who's going to deliver him that's captive in that body of sin and flesh and death? Death. It's the doorway to heaven, baby. Watch it. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord so then with the mind, spirit, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. So listen. We're not to give up. We're not to give in. To the, to the struggle between our spirit man and our um, flesh man. But if you're not born of God, there is no struggle. You're captive. Your, your spirit is stuck to your body and you're uh, contaminated and damned to hell because of what your flesh does. And your flesh is damned when it's born because it's got corrupt blood flowing in it. So, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. But once you're born of Christ, here comes this thing. I know some of you are like, oh, no, no, don't teach that again. I've got to. So how does God get around it? There's nothing good in you. God doesn't dwell in your body. God didn't die for your body. but your spirit. So how does the Spirit of God dwell in you, but not in your flesh? By the spiritual circumcision. I won't take long. Colossians 2, 11 through 15. This is the process that God has uh, made so that He can dwell in you, in your body, but not be touched by your infirmities and sin and sickness and all your devilish ways. Watch. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. And if you weren't here during the teaching we did on circumcision for weeks and weeks and weeks, all the circumcision for all those thousands of years of all of those male Jewish men was all a dress rehearsal and a type and a sign to the real circumcision. And it's not, a, it's not a physical circumcision of a part of your body. It's a spiritual circumcision. But the other circumcision was to teach you this. And yet not one out of a million pulpits teach it. That's back to the first of this study. The blame lies in the pulpit. If every preacher would teach this, Every Christian would have an understanding of how God can call them holy when they know they're, they're not. And how God can save their soul, yet they're walking around in a fleshly, sinful body. Then you understand the struggle. Then you can begin to put the sin out of your body. Watch it. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. What does it cut away? Circumcision is an operation. It's a cutting. In the putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So your body is cut away from your soul and spirit and put off of you. The sins are put off of you. So now when you sin in your body, they don't damn your soul to hell because your soul is no more stuck to your flesh. 
It's a circumcision made without hands. It's a spiritual cutting away of the putting off of the sinful body. Look at 12. Buried with Him in baptism, where are you also risen with Him through the faith of the operation. It's an operation. Every circumcision is an operation. Well, this is what the Bible calls the operation of God. It's the operation of God who has raised Him from the dead. 13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath He quickened together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. Well, who's He talking to? He's talking to people that are breathing, seeing, hearing, walking around. He ain't talking about they're dead physically. They're dead spiritually. But when they were quickened by the seed of God, which is the Word of God, to life, born of God, when they were quickened, they were also circumcised. Watch the next verse. Blotting out the handwriting ordinances that was against us. Get your spirit. Because it was stuck to your body. And when you committed sin, it would contaminate your soul and spirit. Therefore, send them to hell. But once you're born of God, God can't dwell in that. So His seed quickens your spirit to life. He cuts that away. Now, now you're trapped in it, but you're not stuck to it. So now you can... You're, the Bible says you're free from sin. Not free to sin. Some of them took it like that. Well, now, now that I'm born of God, I can just sin, 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 and He'll forgive me. That's not, what it's, that's not what it's about. You're free from sin. What does that mean? It means sin doesn't have a hold on you like it did before. You're free from sin. Now you have a part of you that can come against the sin that your flesh wants to commit and says, no, we don't want to do that. And the world says you're psychotic because you're talking to yourself. And if you don't talk to yourself, you can't be a victorious Christian. Because your spirit needs to get enough word in it that it puts your flesh down. But our problem is we want to put our flesh up. We want to make it beautiful. And our spirits are ugly. And they're gross. And they're weak. But if you don't understand this teaching, you don't understand the battle that's within you. So sometimes you just think, I, man, I don't even think I'm born again. I, I don't want to do this stuff, but I just keep doing it. I don't want to think these things, but I just keep thinking them. Well, you know, there's a part of you that's stronger than the spirit of you that needs to get strong. Watch it. And brought out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So this Christ in you, that's how it's worked out. So let's go to the fourth mystery. The fourth mystery, we're going to move really fast is the incarnation of Satan. We talked about it last week. What is Satan trying to do? I, I thought about just teaching on it all over again. What he wants to do is what he's wanted to do from the beginning of time. And during Genesis 6, before the flood, the only way he knew to corrupt the bloodstream of the human beings on the planet was through the physical act of sex. By making a baby with uh, angelic blood and human blood it would alter the DNA of those baby humans to where they were not human. But he doesn't need to do that now. Through technology, they can alter your DNA to where you're a hybrid now. And the things that are coming are scary. And we talked about it. If you want to see it, go back and look at it. I can't do it over and over, but this is the mystery of the incarnation of Satan in the flesh. Let me just tell you, I don't no, I can't. Second Thessalonians two verse five. Second Thessalonians two five. Remember you not that when I was with you I told you these things. 
Paul was talking to the Thessalonians and now you know what would hold it that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now when the Antichrist is killed, he gets a deadly wound, that's when Satan himself will embody that fleshly body. Well, who's the Antichrist? We don't know, nobody knows. But we've got some front runners running pretty hard right now. But we're looking for some joker, if we're still here, to get a deadly wound. He's going to get his right eye poked out, or blown out, or shot out, or gouged out. The Bible says sword. Maybe it'll be a sword, I don't know. And his arm. It doesn't say right arm, but it says right eye. So we're thinking we're right arm going to wither up. Okay? Now we're looking at that. Now, one thing you, you always got to be looking for the deception. Uh, the, the devil knows the Bible better than anybody in this world. So if I was a devil, I'd, I'd make some, what do they call it in football? When you fake one way and you go the other, I'd pull the old rougarou on them, right? Anyway, here we go. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him, it's a him. It's a him. You know, they used to say Hillary Clinton was the Antichrist. I said, no, it's a him. I mean, not a shim, it's a him. And I, and I, she, I think she was too evil to be the Antichrist, matter of fact. I say that in all love and charity. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, which all power, signs, and lying wonders. So you looking for signs and wonders? They're fixing to get really real. And with all deceivableness, deceivableness follows signs and wonders of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They don't love the truth. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. Oh, you don't want God trying to deceive you. That they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. He will damn them all. He will send the lie that damns them. You want to believe a lie? He'll send you one. So that's the mystery of the incarnation or the indwelling of a human by the devil. The fifth one, the last one we'll look at tonight, is the mystery of the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation started with Abraham and Sarah. Most every denomination says God is through with the Jewish nation, and that's not true. That it's called replacement theology. Um, all your Catholics, all millennialists, all your... Um, Lutherans, Episcopalians, a bunch of Methodists, they all believe in this replacement theology where uh, they take some of the writings of Paul that after uh, Israel rejected Christ, then the true Israel is the born-again Christians and all that stuff. Now that's spiritual descendants of Abraham, but they're still physical, uh, physical descendants of Abraham. They're still a nation that God's dealing with. And that's where they get mixed up. And this, uh, so, uh, most every denomination says that God is through with the nation of Israel. And uh, that's not true. This replacement theology. That's why the Pope wears a half of a grapefruit on his head because one of his titles is the King of Jerusalem. He is not the King of Jerusalem, but he claims to be. That's hogwash. And God will deal with that nation of Israel, and especially that city of Jerusalem, in what we call the tribulation period. And what throws people is there's a spiritual uh, descendant of Abraham, and that's us. Anyone that's born of God. But there is still the natural earthly nation. Real fast, look what God says. Romans chapter 2, 28 and 29. Look at this Bible. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. Now you just read Paul's letter to the Colossians where he explained about the real true circumcision. Here Paul says to the Romans that it's not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. It's not the, the physical circumcision that makes you a Jew spiritually. 
Now he's talking spiritually. Look at verse 29. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. He's talking about spiritual Judaism. He's not disqualifying that there's a nation, that there's Jewish people. There's still Jewish people. Listen, we'll get to it. Hang on. And circumcision is that of the heart. This is what he talked about in Colossians. This is the circumcision of your soul and spirit, or the heart of you, the inner being of you, not the outer part of you, right? In the spirit, he says, and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. So, look at Romans 3, the next two verses. The only thing that separates them is, is your Bible, but in the letter to Paul, they're right together. There's nothing between what I just read you and what he reads here, what he writes here. What advantage then had the Jew? Now see, if you're thinking that he said there is no Jew, then you've got to say he's crazy. But he's talking before spiritual Judaism. Now he says... Physically, what advantage is there to be a Jew? A physical Jew, a nation, a group of people. Watch it. What advantage then have the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. And he says, mainly that they were honored by giving God gave them their word. That's physical. That's physical. Go to Galatians 3, verse 28. Watch this. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Now, is that true? Well, no, that ain't true. There's Jews, there's Greeks, there's Potawatomies, there's Cherokees, there's Africans, there's Egyptians, there's... But he ain't talking about globally. He's talking about inwardly. Watch it. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. Now is that true? Well, heaven no, man. The United States has more people locked up in prison than any other nation on the world in the world. Almost every other nation combined. Free? Who the cat hair is free in here? Free. That's a big ruse. Free. You live free? Yeah, I'm free. No, you ain't. We have a little diner over there, right? And don't even pay for itself. The other day, I didn't even see him, but I know what he looked like. A little beady eyed, little bald head, little beady eyed, little beady eyed, little scum, beady eyed, little tax collector came by. He said, Y'all got to fill this out. I said, well, okay. We want to know what that refrigerator cost when it was new. Well, it's 25 years old. Well, we don't care. We want to know what it cost when it's new. Well, I bought it at an auction for $75. I don't care what it cost when it's new. Hey, somebody paid taxes on it when it was new, and then it got sold 10 times, and then I bought that an auction for $75. I didn't give $2,500 for it. That's what it cost new. Well, we want to know what it cost new. How many times are you going to tax somebody on this? It went out the next day. <laughs> oh, we want to know how much, grill, how much this grill costs. Well, I bought that grill off of Facebook for 100 bucks, But they cost about $2,000 new. Okay, put down $2,000. Well, you going to tax me? No, you got to put how old it is, and then we'll decide the, the, the uh, what do they call it? Depreciation. Depreciation. Little B.I., little B. Ooh. See, Matthew was a tax collector. That's why the rest of the disciples were like, no, I don't even want him. How could you, how could you hold your head up and walk around as a man when you go a little bit and you were doing that stuff? Just like the two police officers that went to that little boy's house that his little spineless LGBTQ loving teacher seen a BB gun in his own bedroom and she turned him into the police for having a gun in the classroom. How could you as a police officer? I'd refuse the order. 
There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Male or female, we got like 130 some genders now. Male or female. Now let's be honest. Is he nuts or are we nuts? Is there males and females? I mean, in almost everybody in this room, you can tell the difference. Almost. <laughs> Well, we got to think. He ain't talking about in the flesh. He could care less about the flesh. He's talking about in the spirit. Listen, you might be in prison, and your flesh might be locked up, and you might be deservedly so, because you're going to reap what you sow in the flesh. But you may not, you wouldn't have to be bound in the spirit. But to sit there and say he's talking about the flesh, you'd have to be cuckoo for cocoa puffs. There, there is Jews and Greeks. There is male and female. There are bound and free, but not in the Spirit. Watch. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. You're not, you're not one in the flesh. This is a spiritual thing. So the key word to that whole verse is what? In in what well, you know, you can it don't matter that all the Bibles are the same. You can just take these words out and throw them around. I can show you where if you take uh, the word I or A out of the verse, it changes the whole verse. That's why the Bible says, Don't be taking out no little even punctuation marks. Now, listen, you've got to take words out and put words in when you change from one language to the next. That's not talking about that, it's talking about you took out a little old bitty word that you didn't think was nothing and it changed the whole verse. And in would change the whole verse. So, look at Romans 11, verse 25 through 29. We're talking about this thing called the Jewish nation. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. It's a mystery. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part is having to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Blindness has happened to them in part. There are some Jews that are born again, but not very many because they've been blinded by their traditions and their religion and their leaders. They're Sanhedrin. They're priests. They led them astray. They were devils. And they still are. I don't understand how people don't care that the number one sucking uh, parasite on the American taxpayer is the Jewish nation. And they think they're doing God a service. Have you read the last book? He calls them Sodom. He calls them Babylon. He calls them synagogues of Satan. Why? Because they've been infiltrated. You don't think the devil's not in? They're imposters. They're not the Jewish line of Abraham. But there's a remnant. So you leave them alone. Don't go over there. Don't get anti-Semitic. Don't start talking down to them. Let God... Have you read the Old Testament? It's just one beating after another beating that God gives His people. We don't have to worry about beating on them, hating on them. He'll take care of them. And so all Israel shall be saved. When's that going to happen? Are they just all going to be saved? No. When He comes back to save their hides, if He doesn't come back, they'll all be wiped out. That's what the devil wants to do. He loves to kill Jews. And he loves to kill Christians. And there was more Christians killed last year than uh, almost all the rest of the years put together. But nobody knows and nobody cares. They've annihilated cities of, of Christian people in the Middle East. Watch it. I gotta go. And so all of Israel shall be saved. All the Israelites, the true Israelites, the true Jews, that are left at the end of the tribulation, uh, they'll start to believe when the two witnesses show up at the beginning of the tribulation. And they'll start to believe and the 144,000 will go all over the world preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So there shall come out of the Zion the Deliverer. When are they going to get saved? When the Deliverer comes out of Zion and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. 
For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As according the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, the elect, the elect, the election, that ain't talking about Trump's election. It's talking about a group of people that are called the election, the elect, over and over and over. They are beloved for the Father's sake. For the gifts and the callings of God, uh, of God are without repentance. He still loves them people, but if they die without Jesus Christ, they go to hell just like everybody else. It doesn't mean all of them that's ever breathed there is going to be saved. It means the one that sees their deliverer coming, they'll all believe. So, it'll happen when he comes back. I got one last verse, Matthew 24. 23 and 24, watch this, this ain't talking about you. Matthew 24, 23, and if it, this is a Jewish, uh, Jewish Messiah, God in the flesh, talking to Jewish disciples. In a Jewish land, on Jewish ground, eating Jewish food, Sabbath observing, pork abstaining. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, you're there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ, well, who's a false Christ? That's an antichrist, ain't it? And false prophets? Who's a false prophet? Revelation's got a false prophet. Now, he named them both right there. And shall show great signs and wonders. There you go again. Insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. How many times on TVN have you heard that preach? If Jesus didn't come back, all of us Christians would be duped. And we'd lose our salvation and all burn hell. I wish I had some cotton candy hair and maybe somebody listen to me. He ain't talking about you, fool. He's talking about the elect. The very elect. And that's God's people. So what is over there right now is the devil's counterfeit. Those aren't true Jewish people. They're a band of imposters. They hate you and they hate the Jesus you love. They hate America, but they love your money. And don't be fooled by them. So, we talked about the peace treaty and what was given for peace was uh, F-35s and Black Hawk helicopters. Um, I just want to leave you with this. Don't you think it's strange? Don't you think it's funny? that the terrible terrorist group ISIS never not one time have went into Israel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and these dear people, God. We, we thank you for uh, letting us see these mysteries and Help us to try to unfold these mysteries and understand these mysteries and they unlock uh, hidden things of you and we're uh, so glad that you do it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.